The Israeli Defense Force is the most powerful military force in the Middle East, bar none. Netanyahu is in the process of leading that military and directing it to destroy Hamas because of the horrific uh, and, on, uh, terrorist attack on October the 7th. The question is, though, is that powerful military, is that going to be enough to defeat Hamas and bring peace to Israel? Can you kill your way to peace, which is what the strategy that Netanyahu is currently producing? Let's take a look at that because the answer could uh, be very, very important for what Israel does next, especially heading into 2024, if anyone in the region wants peace. First of all, let's take a look at what Netanyahu actually said uh, about a week and a half or so ago, where he reiterated very articulately, very emphatically, what his objectives are. שחרור חטופנו והסרת האיום מעזה. אנחנו תוקפים את החמאס באש תופת, בכל מקום, כולל היום. אנחנו גם תוקפים את עוזריהם מקרוב ומרחוק. כל מחבלי החמאס, מהראשון עד האחרון, הם בני מוות. יש להם רק שתי אפשרויות, להיכנע או למות. So that's pretty stark. It's this way or that way. It's abject surrender. or everyone dies. That's the, that's the choice that he's given the Palestinians right now. That issue was reinforced earlier today on Fox News, where the official Israeli government expo, uh, spokesman went on Fox to explain, here's what we're doing and here's why we can't negotiate with anyone. We know who the Palestinian Authority are. We know that the Palestinian Authority teaches their children to hate Israelis and to want to kill Israelis. We know that it's run by uh, their president, who wrote his PhD thesis on denial of the Holocaust, who still to this day has not condemned the October 7th massacre, and still to this day believes that the, much of the, what happened on October 7th didn't actually happen. They have denied okay. it publicly. We need to destroy Hamas, okay. and we need to free every last hostage, and we will go forward until we achieve both of those goals. So to sum, between those two statements, you have that Israel wants to destroy Hamas, Implied in there is they want to bring peace. They want to get their hostages back. And that Hamas itself is a dead man walking, to quote uh, Netanyahu. And the Palestinian Authority is uh, apparently led by someone with whom they can't deal. So what you have, the standard there is that they're among the Palestinian people. There is no political entity with which Israel will even talk. So at this point, aside from whatever they want to do to Hamas, and Hamas was the the uh, originator of that terrorist attack on 10-7 and, and by every right should be dealt with and, and destroyed and brought to, to uh, justice for what they did, without question. But if the objective is to bring peace to Israel, is this going to get there? Can you kill all of Hamas and then somehow have peace in the end? Now, uh, on our show here on uh, December 18th, I believe it was, we had a former Palestinian negotiator who is very uh, tied in with the region and what's going on. And he, he gave us a very interesting observation from the past when, it, when the, the Palestinian people have been willing to work with Israel and that could at least laid the foundation for the possibility of peace. And even though that was not subsequently uh, su uh, successful, there was many reasons for that. But note what he says here is an absolute requirement for any hope for peace. Would seem to then to leave the people in Gaza, all the Palestinians, whether the West Bank or in the Strip, still with no even aspiration for a two-state solution. And I can't even imagine that even if Hamas is completely eradicated, and I don't know how you would do that physically, but let's just say for a moment that it did. What condition does that leave these roughly 5 million people in the West Bank and, and in Gaza? And will they live in peace or will there be the risk of a new radical uh, element rising in the ashes? Look, if there is no hope, then uh, you will not have peace. It's it's that simple. And, and I go back, I mean, uh, as someone in the advantage of ages that I was there in the 1990s, and we saw that when hope was there, 
people were actually against Hamas. You know, friends of mine who were in the security forces would tell me, the Palestinian security forces would tell me, you want to go in the 1990s and arrest a Hamas uh, terrorist? Uh, you know, the neighborhood will tell you this is where he is because they saw Hamas at that time as a threat to the, their hopes and to their aspirations. So there, there's no hopes and aspirations. So revenge comes in as kind of the uh, prime motivator. So, man, that could not be any more clear. When we're talking specifically about these people and their history in the region and all the trauma that's been going on between Israel and, and the Palestinian people since 1948, basically, if the Palestinian people believe there's hope, then they're willing to negotiate. They're willing, don't miss this, they're willing to turn against Hamas if they have hope that there's something better in the future. Now, I've personally seen this play out myself in, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and in 2009, one of the uh, uh, acknowledged experts in, in counterinsurgency warfare that uh, advised all of the senior American officials, both uh, political and military, uh, a guy by the name of Kilcullen from, from uh, Australia, uh, wrote a book called I believe it was the the unintended gorilla or something to that effect. But he he went on a, a tour to talk about that book and made a very interesting observation of what he had seen personally in Afghanistan. These guys belong to a category of enemy who I call the accidental gorillas that we're fighting in some parts of the war on terrorism. They're a category category of person who doesn't hate the West, is not interested in coming to America to attack us, has no particular desire to impose their way of life on us, but they're fighting us primarily because we're in their face. We turned up in their valley. We turned up in their village. We went in there chasing Al-Qaeda or one of the other terrorist groups, and they're being manipulated by these local groups of uh, extreme radicals, and they're fighting us because, you know, their cousin was killed or we destroyed uh, one of their friend's villages or something like that. Okay, man, don't miss that last part he was talking about there. Many of the people who fought against us through 20 years in Afghanistan and on and off in, in Iraq since 2003, and we're still there to this day. Many of the people that, that were fighting us is because we were there, is because we accidentally killed some of their family members, is because we killed or destroyed their village. That's why they're fighting. That's why he called it the accidental guerrilla, because in their culture, you have to have revenge if someone murders a member of your family. Now, I don't have to tell you too much graphically about what's going on in the Gaza Strip right now and, and the tens of thousands of Palestinian people, a vast majority of which are innocent men, women and children are being killed. There was a report, and I think it was the Wall Street Journal last week, that 1000 children now in the Strip have had to undergo amputations with no anesthesia. Now, just imagine, put yourself in the position of, of the father of any one of those children, all of those children. Now, how willing are you going to be to work with a, a government that was firing bombs ostensibly to go after their enemy, but killed your kid or wounded your kid so that they had to go through the torture of an of a amputation? Dude, we're talking about civil war kind of thing here where there was no anesthesia. They just didn't have enough of it. It's just horrific kinds of situations here. How willing is that father, is that mother, is that cousin, is that brother going to be towards the, the, the regime that, that conducted that operation, resulting in that damage to your family? You're not going to want to do it. Even if you were passive towards Israel before, every time that happens, you build more and more enemies. Listen, folks, you, you've heard me say it many times here, and it bears repeating. You cannot kill your way to peace. Now, Israel is the most powerful military force in the region, but I'm here to tell you, if they don't change their strategy, if they don't adopt a different pathway forward, if they don't give the Palestinian people any reason to hope, they are going to not only not destroy all of Hamas, that, that almost won't even matter anymore because you can put a different tag on them. They'll be creating so many more enemy than ever that existed prior to 10-7 than you can even imagine. Israel is building up future uh, uh, insecurity for itself. I know that, that Netanyahu wants to be tough. I know that he wants to be show strength during wartime. And, and on, on the surface of it, that's, that's a good thing for an, a wartime leader to have. But only if that strength and that conviction 
leads to peace. For you to win a war and bring peace to your people, there has to be, folks, don't, don't miss this, there has to be wisdom along with strength. If you just try to say, I'm going to ignore all the realities. I'm going to ignore what Kilcullen talked about there. I'm going to ignore what, what the U.S. had through 20 years. And I'm going to do this because I want to, because this, I can just use power. And I don't have to talk to those people I don't like to. I know what the, the, the hideous, heinous attacks of 10-7 and what some of those Palestinians did to the civilians is just unfathomable. And you can totally understand why the Israeli people who have all this power would act on it because of what happened there. But when you act in such a way that so many additional innocent people, equally innocent people, are slaughtered in large numbers, so far 20 times more than what the Israelis suffered. Just imagine the same anger on the Israeli side is 20 times at the bare minimum building up on the Palestinian side. So at the moment, yes, Israel's going after Hamas, and presumably they're killing large numbers of them, the thousands of them. But are they diminishing the threat to a future Israeli state? And I would argue that they're doing the opposite. Whatever the, call, the, the angst was on the 6th of October is probably already through the roof in the current situation. So how do you get there? How then do you bring peace? If this is not going to bring peace, what do you do? They're going to have to change the dynamics. Now, similar to what Kilcullen had, I, I personally observed it. There, there was, uh, during my time in Afghanistan, I was there during the time of the Obama surge when we said, hey, we're going to put in, you know, tens of thousands more troops and we're going to try to replicate what happened with the Iraqi surge and and bring peace to Afghanistan. That was the objective. And so we, we went out and, and put a whole brigades in areas of Afghanistan we'd never had them before, ostensibly to try and pacify the, the area, put the hearts and minds of the people, I'm sure you remember that phrase, and, and win them over so that they would join our side and turn against the Taliban. That was our objective. That's what, like Petraeus, that's what he said, because he was the one in charge of that. But I saw that the execution was very far from that. There was one particular case to where there was this mid-level Taliban leader uh, that our forces have been trying to get for years, and, and they just couldn't get him. They couldn't nail him down. And then finally one day, and again, this is during the time I was there, they finally got the guy cornered. Uh, they had a big firefight, and he was actually captured alive. And in the interrogation, uh, a friend of mine was, was the lead interrogator there, and, and I remember this so clearly to this day because he himself was just so surprised at, at the, what happened in the interrogation. He said, listen, you know, we've been trying to find you for all this time. And he was trying to find out, you know, how they've been operating and the, the tactics, techniques and procedures so that maybe we could, you know, use it to, to track down other leaders or whatever. And at one of the points he asked him, he said, but, you know, I'm just curious, what, why did you join the Taliban? And he said the guy had been just kind of passive and been answering questions. And all of a sudden he said his eyes locked on him and he said he saw rage in his eyes. And he said, I didn't want to. I hated the Taliban. But when you guys came here and you're going after the Taliban, you ended up killing one of my family members and, and there was a big firefight and people in our village were killed. Then I, I had no choice. I had to go against you. Then I had to fight. And, and you, you, it was just so ironic. This guy wanted to be on our side, but because of our actions had in collateral damage, accidentally killed some of his family members. He felt obligated for his culture to respond. Now in a situation like the Gaza strip where there's 2.3 million people and virtually all of them, now have been displaced. They can barely get enough food or water to eat. Disease is now starting to rise up there. And there is no hope, as Mr. Alamari talked about. There's no hope for them. Israel is giving them no hope, either now or into the future. In such a situation, you create desperation and anger with no other outlet than to continue fighting the people who are oppressing you. Look, you don't have to like the Palestinians to be able to say, if Israel wants peace, this ain't going to get it done, folks. This is not going to result in peace. And we get so locked in on the tactics and the, the military operations for this day. And have they cleared this much of northern God? Those things don't even matter in the strategic uh, viewpoint. You understand that? I, I, I want to be so clear here. The objective is supposed to bring peace to Israel. 
not to have a tactical military victory here. Israel is so strong. They'll have a tactical military success in virtually everything they go into. Though they are suffering high casualties, and I'm not sure they can sustain that over a whole lot of time. But that's a separate issue right now. But when you're talking about any engagement, I mean, how could it be different when you have Israel with a powerful air force and all the backing from the United States and all the technology? Uh, the Hamas has nothing. They don't have air defense. Uh, you know, they don't have a drone fleet of their own. As we saw, actually, just hours ago, they launched uh, 27 rockets into Israel, which were so impotent uh, because they're not sophisticated. 18 were shot down and the rest of them landed in a field and hit nothing. No one was even injured. So they are so impotent militarily. And yet that's not the issue when it comes to can Israel have peace? They're going to have to do something they don't want to do. And I don't know that Netanyahu is the guy that can do that. I think for their sake, and this is totally for them to decide, we don't have any play in this at all. But I think that more and more Israelis are going to come to the recognition that if they want peace, they're going to have to have somebody else at the top that can give hope to the Palestinians. And, and look, they got to be clear. And I want to be clear to you. No one is saying that they need to make peace with Hamas, the architect of 10-7. They have to make peace with the Palestinian people, with the innocent Palestinian people who just want to live and have a future. If, if Israel is never willing to give that to them, folks, they will never have peace. If you care for the peace of Jerusalem, if you care for the Israeli people, if you want them to have themselves a future and a hope, then you also need to endorse the idea that they have got to give hope to the Palestinian people. Otherwise, what we've seen since 10-7 will just continue on. Netanyahu once said in the early part of this that he was having this big military operation because he didn't want to have these wars every you know three to five to seven years because this is the fifth one with Hamas. So he said that's why they're doing this, but this is not going to get that done. I've personally observed it. You can see it playing out with your own eyes. If you're not emotionally involved to where you just have this blinding rage that you want to kill all the people responsible and you don't care about the casualties that happen as a result, that may be emotionally satisfying for the moment, but you're building up insecurity for your own children, for your own future, and for the region. And as we talk about it here a lot, American interests are to end this war and to prevent it escalating. Every day this goes on, every day we have issues in the Red Sea, every day we have issues with uh, ran back units uh, against our troops in Iraq, in Syria, the risk of this war con escalating continues on. Hezbollah, potentially, in the north against Israel itself that continues to escalate. And, and the war and the carnage could expand, and then it gets out of anyone's control. It is in everyone's interest that Israel needs to change its strategy and change its focus and bring the possibility of genuine and lasting peace to this issue with the Palestinians. That's your that's your uh, deep dive for today, uh, and we are so grateful to, to see you all here Thanks for joining us and sharing part of your New Year's Day with us here. We're very grateful for that. We value every one of you who are watching. Ask you to like and subscribe and share with your friends because, folks, we're giving you stuff here you don't get anywhere else. You don't get this level of, of, of context and knowledge in a deep dive that you can't get in a three-minute episode on any uh, major news channel. And you're not getting all the this, this straight information that you get on there because I'm telling you stuff that you might not like and that some people are uncomfortable with. But, folks, we are unintimidated and uncompromised on bringing you the truth that you need to make sense of your world. We ask you to join us tomorrow. By the way, we got a big show for you tonight. tomorrow. we got a couple of big ones, actually. One with uh, show favorites uh, uh, Tony Schaefer and Doug McGregor. And we're going to be talking about different aspects of what we can expect to see in a lot of hot spots around the world in 2024. You're not going to want to miss it. But we will see you then at uh, 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. tomorrow. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.